Okay, this is our inaugural distinguished lecture series. So we have uh, a distinguished guest from India. <laughs> uh, Manfred Marai also happens to be in the governing committee of the institute. Uh, he's a member of the National Academy of Engineering. <coughs> Uh, he was head of the Department of Information Technology and Electrical Engineering at ETA Zurich from 2009 to 2012. He was head of the Automatic Control Laboratory from 1994 to 2008. Before that, he was the McCollum Corcoran Professor of Chemical Engineering and Executive Officer for Control and Dynamical Systems at Caltech. <coughs> he obtained the diploma from ETA Zurich and the PhD from the University of Minnesota both in chemical engineering. His interests are in hybrid systems and the control of biomedical systems. In recognition of his research contributions, he received numerous awards, among them the Donald P. Ekman Award, uh, John R. Ragazzini Award, and Richard E. Bellman Control Heritage Award of the ACC, the American Automatic Control Council. The Alan P. Colburn Award and the Professional Progress Award of the AICAC, the Curtis W. McGraw Research Award of the ASEE, Dr. Honoris Kaza from Babis Balyai University. He's a fellow of numerous societies. IEEE is one of them. IFAC, AICAC, and he also received the IEEE Control System Technical Award. Am I right? Thank you very much. Thank you, for coming. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very pleased to be here and to uh, participate in this uh, inaugural uh, series. Um, as uh, you just heard, uh, this lecture is sponsored by the Institute for Advanced Systems Engineering, which uh, in turn uh, was established in the support of uh, United Technology Corporation. And so I'm here in, in two functions today. Um, UTC related, I'm a member of the Technical Advisory Committee at uh, United Technology, uh, and I'm a member of the Governing Board. But uh, my real job, okay, the day job, is at ETH in, in uh, Switzerland, as you heard. Uh, I've been there a professor for uh, 20 years. Uh, almost to the day, actually, May 15th, next week will be 20 years that I've, I've been there. Uh, let me start with a few remarks, uh, just a couple of remarks about UTC, because I learned that, you know, when we had visited the, the Switzerland, I'm going to see Zurich for the first time, and so you, though you have UTC next door, you may not know everything, or you may know very little about UTC. So, the business, Halfway to roughly is commercial and halfway to this, this aerospace. And uh, best is to look at the brand names that I associate because in the segment on the commercial side you have Otis elevators and, and escalators that you have uh, on the on the uh, uh, climate controls side you have uh, for example Carrier um, or you have Chubb um, uh, and other corporations on the on the building side. And on the aerospace side, the brands that you may recognize are Pratt & Whitney, uh, aircraft engines, Sikorsky, aircraft, uh, Sikorsky helicopters, and uh, general uh, aerospace uh, systems and defense products. In terms of the size of the company, you have a $60 billion company sales, uh, about. And, uh, of this, you see that about half of it is this commercial industrial sector, and half of it, uh, the, the rest. Um, it is part uh, of the um, Dow Jones Industrial, so the 30 companies that make out of the Dow Jones Industrial Index, one of them is uh, in a different job. What you may be more interested in, actually, how many people there are. 200,000 people employed by United Technology all over the world. Especially interesting for you, maybe how many engineers? So about 24,000 engineers worldwide spread over the whole world. So that's about United Technology. Then my real job, ETH. So a few numbers about uh, ETH. 
founded in 1855, so it's, I remember that's similar to MIT. It was my a, a few years. Uh, we consider ourselves as one of the leading international universities for technology. According to the various ranking systems, ETH is ranked the first technological university in continental Europe, meaning that usually Cambridge and Oxford are ranked ahead of us. In terms of numbers, we are much smaller than you are, despite the fact that we have grown a lot over the last uh, 10, 20 years. About 18,000 students, uh, half of whom are undergraduates, roughly, and half of them master and PhD students. 500 professors, 8,000 personnel, and a budget of about 1.5 billion Swiss francs. And uh, roughly, this is uh, uh, 1.7 or so billion uh, US dollars which is a very large number given the other numbers in terms of uh, students. And uh, the high budget is an indication of the uh, national commitment and the government support. And undoubtedly, it's an important factor that's responsible for the high standing uh, of ETH. Uh, we have some famous alum. Uh, Albert Einstein actually studied at ETH. Uh, the others here, you probably will not know. Uh, Wolfgang Pauli may be a physicist, and the rest of them are chemists. Chemistry is probably uh, the most uh, famous, or certainly one of the most famous uh, departments at uh, ETH, in addition to architecture and um, uh, also biology. Uh, just as a curiosity, if you read the New York Times uh, last week, April 27th, there was an obituary a person by the name of John Hubble. Uh, he got his PhD at ETH in, in 1958. And I must say, I didn't know about John Hubble until I read this obituary. But it's actually a very interesting story associated with him. So you may know that most of you are probably too young. But uh, President John F. Kennedy in, in 1961 announced we're going to send a man to the moon by the end of this decade. Okay? And actually, NASA was caught in surprise. They didn't know about this announcement, and so they were struggling to come up with a, with a program. And so one of the big questions was, you know, how do you get the man to the moon? What strategy are going to, to use? And so one was Werner von Braun, the leader of this program, said uh, the big blast, which was known as NOVA, where you just shoot some enormous rocket up and and get it back somehow. Uh, the others said we have some Earth orbiting spacecraft, and then we send something to the moon and get it back. Uh, but for both of those options, the cost and the complications seemed overwhelming. And then Hubble um, came up with a suggestion. Actually, he passed off. He was a low man there at NASA. He wrote the letter at the very top. Of it person under the top uh, of NASA and said, you know, do you want to get to the moon or not? Okay, if you want to get there, you need to have this approach that you send the spacecraft around to the moon, and then you have the little lunar module landing and to get it back up and then return to Earth. And surprisingly, actually, somebody at NASA listened to him. And, uh, and this was the approach that was adopted. And so later on, when he was not at NASA anymore in 1969, um, he was invited back, and then supposedly Werner von Braun went up to him after the successful landing and said, John, it works beautifully. So that's the story about John Hubble, PhD in mechanical engineering at uh, ETH in 1958. Also, what I found interesting, actually, ETH, even at that time, now it's not an issue, was open enough, he wrote his thesis in English. Okay, and that was totally... Uh, accepted, though English is not in any way a national language in, in, in Switzerland. So let me get to, the, um, to my talk. So um, as you heard, or as maybe you gathered from uh, the kind introduction, is uh, my career had two periods. Uh, one uh, is the first 20 years 
exactly 40 years ago this year, I came to the United States. I spent 20 years in the United States as a student and on the faculty at Wisconsin and Caltech. 20 years ago, I went to Switzerland. Okay, started in May 15th uh, of 1994. When I was in the US, it was all chemical engineering. <coughs> my training was in chemical engineering and my research was in chemical engineering. And then coming to the, um, back to Switzerland, the opening was in, in mechanical engineering, uh, sorry, in electrical engineering. And it was not some clever career move, but it just it happened to be there. And so I had my last 20 years as an electrical engineer and did research in this, uh, in this area. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is in some sense both those areas. Uh, what I will be talking about is how concepts that we have in process systems engineering, which is let's say the chemical engineering part of systems engineering, how those concepts, and especially uh, process optimization and control, can be transferred to other disciplines. But also, I want you to see my talk as our search that we have done continuously for practical problems that can be approached by theoretical solutions. Okay. And so that's a returning thing. The other thing I want to say is that uh, what I'm going to talk about today is a high-level overview talk. As you heard, tomorrow I'm going to talk a little bit more de detail about multiple controls. And this is not all our work, or certainly not all my work. Uh, I was lucky that I had a, a absolutely wonderful group of, uh, of uh, students, postdocs, colleagues, uh, more than 70 PhD students, many postdocs, uh, 25 to 30, haven't counted, have now academic positions all over the, uh, the world. And so I want to acknowledge their contribution for that. In particular, I want to mention the people down here. Um, Colin Jones and Paul Gulag, both of them were postdoc, actually, Paul uh, still is a researcher. Uh, Colin Jones now is a faculty member at our sister institution in Switzerland, the DPFL in Lausanne. And Alex Domahidi and Stefan Richter, two uh, graduate students who just finished their uh, thesis in the last uh, half year or so. So what I want like to do with talks like this, start with the main message, because you may fall asleep. Um, um, so let me take the main message, and we'll return to it a little bit at, at the end. Uh, and uh, the question that I want to ad address this with, uh, with this talk is, what is driving innovation in the control area? And uh, my premise is that First of all, it's technology. Okay, so what do we mean by technology? It's like this transition from mechanical system to electrical system, electronic devices, process computer, <coughs> microprocessor. That's the technology. That's really what's driving it. Underneath comes then when this technology inspires some clever engineers who just use this technology in an ad hoc manner. And then comes uh, later a group of control theorists who suggest on how to make things better. And sometimes these discoveries make their way back up. Uh, and uh, they may be affecting control engineering. And they even may affect technology. But keep in mind, the main drivers go from technology down to engineering to control theory. And this is essentially also reflected in public perception. When you talk to people who are not going to school with you, they will say, OK, they know about the latest computer. Okay, they will not know about the latest control algorithm. So public realizes this error going in this way as I have drawn it. On the other hand, we in academia who want to study theory, we actually need that error to go the other way. Okay? We want to create the impression that control theory is driving 
engineering and this driving technology. But unfortunately, it's not. But we want it because our funding, in a way, our ideas depend on the driver, error going this way. And so in this talk, I will try to also communicate what we can do about this issue. But keep in mind, for the next five, 10 minutes, this error here, going from technology, engineering, theory. Okay. So let me start with a few historical examples of exactly this transition in this direction of the era. Uh, after that, I will talk about uh, MPC, model predictive control, and this will also lead me to the topic of, of uh, complexity that is increasingly, increasing, uh, that's increasingly important. And I will focus then on fast MPC, uh, an area that developed an identity of its own in the, in the last uh, decade, and finally I will make some speculations about the, the future. And so let me start with hardware, analog hardware. The example that you are familiar with, steam engine, James Watt, 18th century. And what made this a success was this Watt governor that regulates the speed of this engine. So it was this analog control technology. It was at the beginning. And obviously then there came the engineers, and the steam engine by its importance attracted hordes of engineers that tried to make all kind of clever modifications to the uh, Watt governor, but it wasn't all successful. And uh, so there were many governors, 75,000 of those governors in England uh, by 1868, but they had their problems and they were referred to as, as hunting. And that problem attracted the theoreticians. And the theoretician at this time was James Clark Maxwell, didn't you know from the Maxwell equation, but then did the first, I would say, control theory paper in the, in the literature, and he came up with a mathematical problem, finding the roots of a polynomial, that he then turned to the uh, Royal Academy and said, who can solve this, and that Rouse was uh, the person who came up with a solution to that problem when are the roots in the right half plane or in the right half uh, plane. And uh, but what was the impact now of this theory of Rouse of Maxwell on actually building steam engines? So in the opinion of historians, and I must say I didn't read Maxwell's paper, in the opinion of historians, Maxwell's paper was hard to read but actually the ideas found their ways into, into Rouse's famous book. But the uh, question, did they actually solve the hunting governor problem? And uh, it seems that they did not. Okay? But because at the time that this book became widely, ava widely available in the 1880s, the problem of oscillations of governors had already been solved. Okay? So the impact, though we all talk about it, but the impact of this theory on the practice of steam engine was, was minimal. We'll jump forward by 20 years or so, control technology in, in, in Switzerland. See here around uh, 1910. Uh, actually, what this shows is the, the, the product of uh, a company called the BBC, Brown Bavaria Company. It was founded in 1891. And then in nine, you may not know it is by this name, but in 1988, it's merged with a Swedish company, ASEA. It is now ADB uh, company. So that was the technology, this electrical technology that we moved on from the from the hardware that I showed you in the what's coming. Uh, and at that time at ETH there was a professor by the name of Harald Stodora, and he had studied a similar problem to what Maxwell studied, only he didn't know that Maxwell had already studied it. Uh, and he wrote the paper on the control of, of turbines, and he came, he got stuck on exactly the same problem that Maxwell got stuck on, namely how to determine the roots of the polynomial right or left up. Right? So he went to his applied mathematics friend at ETH, and the applied mathematics friend at ETH was Adolf Hurwitz. And Hurwitz came up with the criterion, again in parallel to Rouse, different explanation, different criterion, but same objective by the roots of the left half plane and the right half plane. So clearly this begs the question, you know, so how about this theory? Had this any impact on 
practice of the turbine regulation, and surprisingly did. Actually, this paper by Hurwitz that was published in a mathematics journal carried the footnote that these results were applied at the Davos spa turbine plant with brilliant success. And I would say it is this impact of theory on practice that serves to us at ETH that do research now as an inspiration on how research should be done. So let me move on to predictive control and let me move to this more recent history that uh, I have witnessed in one form, form or another. And that's the uh, control technology implemented on digital computers. And uh, actually, we have a 50 year anniversary, exactly 50 years ago, the IBM 1800 was introduced, which was maybe not the first controlled computer, but it was the first widely used uh, controlled computer. And so that made possible, in principle, application of very different types of algorithms as the analog hardware that we had seen before. And one of them to think about is this model predictive control concept. And the concept is that we're using a plant model to plan our future inputs or control moves in order to make the plant uh, respond in a de high desired fashion. And then we wait one sampling time. Uh, and we'll look at the, we implement the, only the first one of those uh, moves and then wait one sampling time. Uh, check the result and replan. So it's this moving horizon type of approach that's essential feature of this model predictive uh, control. Uh, there was some theory, and there's some theory by a name, person named Propoy, but now we recognize the theory that would support predictive control at that time, and note that's before the IBM 1800 was introduced. So it was a very visionary paper. By the time, it probably had no impact at all, okay, because people didn't understand it, didn't follow it. And actually, even after the introduction of digital computer, you know, had control systems like here for some distillation columns that are, were just done in the same way as they had done uh, for decades, only analog algorithms implemented on digital computers, but no functional difference. And in other areas, like gas turbine fuel control, it was exactly the same, and here's a slide I took from a talk that John Cassidy, who was the director of the United Technology Research Center, gave many decades ago. In gas turbine, it basically looked the same. A lot of uh, overrides, uh, comparisons, uh, etc. The real difference with respect to model predictive control came through a person by the name of Charlie Cutler. Uh, he actually was a graduate student at the University of Houston. He had those ideas about model predictive control. He called it dynamic matrix control. It's in his PhD proposal that he, he sent to me when I questioned him about the, about the historical background. And then he left the University of Houston because he felt he couldn't have an impact by writing a thesis on this. He went to Shell. And he was actually responsible of this being used and implemented at, uh, uh, at, at Shell. Um, and it's always interesting to say, you know, how did he get it done? You know, this is not simple, okay, a totally different technology. How did they get a company to do that? Um, you know, did he do a lot of comparisons, of different algorithms, evaluations? No, he said, you're going to do it. And that's why it was done. And if you read uh, surveys of the Japanese industry decades later, there was one done and, and published at the uh, Conference of Process Control, say that did a survey of the Japanese companies, why did you use uh, model predictive control? And the dominant answer was because the competition is okay. So again, no evaluation, just because of the competition. But he got it done. Uh, if you look at his thesis, and I was actually one of the, one of the referees on the thesis, it's hopeless. You know, don't try to read it. To understand how this works was totally impossible. But, uh, but he understood it enough to make it work and to make it work throughout uh, the company and throughout the industry. And so in 1991, when I gave a talk actually in Boston at the ACC, I said, there's very little theory to support the use of this DMC or constraint MPC. That was engineering. Intuition that was used there successfully. 
But actually, it wasn't quite as bad as I thought. Only the theory was developed, the major features, by Cathy and Gilbert from the University of Michigan. Uh, they'd written a paper, but it was totally, again, not appreciated, not recognized. Even people afterwards who wrote important papers, Lawrence and Muskie, very important papers, uh, five years later didn't even cite uh, Cathy and Gilbert. So the ideas are clearly there. From then it took, on, it took off. And uh, actually, I should say the Cat Guild, but it had the main ideas. And there were many other papers following then, 1993, the last 20 years. Okay. Exactly the same idea as Cat and Gilbert, different details. Important details, but the ideas were established in this 1980. And the applications are many. Here is some survey by Chin and, and Badgewell, which is often shown. By 2003, there's some 4,500 applications of this algorithm. And what's also interesting is the size of the problem. So you see, for example, the largest application, 603 uh, outputs, 283 inputs, okay. as one multivariable control system just to give you a sense of the size of the variable control problems. So looking at this, you know, most of it done without uh, theory, you may say, okay, what's the impact of the theory I mentioned here? Okay, well, what, what, is, what good has it done? It has helped, okay? What does it help? If you look at this algorithm by Cutler, those that you could barely read there, that was not suited for scaling. Okay? You couldn't do that on a large system, you couldn't there was no hope of doing maintenance on an algorithm uh, 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 like that. Uh, furthermore, you know, this was the first time, and there's still no other design method that allows you to design a multivariable control <coughs> system for, let's say, a system with 10 inputs, 10 outputs, constraints with stability guarantees. If somebody gives you a control algorithm for a system of this size, you can't even analyze if it's stable or not, except by simulation. And MPC is still the only way to, by design, come up with a stable system. Third point, the theory brought academic um, uh, respectability. And that's not unimportant. Before that, you know, the senior leaders in the control community tended to brush away MPC and said, oh, this is some some trivial approach that the chemical engineers are using has really no foundation, etc. And now the foundation, the whole attitude toward this uh, method, at least in the academic community, changed. And vast improvement in education. When you come to the course tomorrow, or the two-hour lecture, you will get a sense of all the details, sense of this, of MPC based on that early work that was done in this area, hopeless. It would two weeks and you would probably still be confused <coughs> how it works. So this theory often is just used to compress a lot of experience and knowledge into a form that can be easily communicated and taught. And that's another important function, even if it doesn't improve uh, performance. So we we'll move on uh, another 10 years to the <laughs> end of the last uh, century, so in 1998, we organized a workshop, a uh, place close to ETH, and it gathered many of the researchers in the North community working on predictive control. And if you look at applications reported in the workshop, it's essentially all process control. Okay. Ten years later, same workshop with overlapping set of organizers, now not in Switzerland, in Pavia, in northern Italy, uh, near Milan. Applications totally moved to different areas. Cross control essentially disappeared. People were now studying systems, automotive, power electronics, etc. So the question is, you know, what, what happened in this decade from 1998 to 2008? What was the big change that now the applications are not just in, in chemical engineering and chemical process control? but now in other areas. Several things changed. Let me describe to you some of them. First of all, clearly faster and different types of computers, and we'll talk about it in detail. 
Second, not only the computers, but all the algorithms have changed. There are now more effective algorithms that were developed in this, in this decade. A new driver became important complexly, which I will talk about, which drives people to go the route of MPC rather than some analog <laughs> type of override uh, system to deal these constraints. And finally, new algorithms, fast MPC, and that's one of the focus areas of this talk that I will uh, speak about in more detail. So first, fast and different types of computers. You may not realize how much, and you may not realize also how much algorithms have improved over this time period, roughly 10, 15 years that I mentioned there. So there's been a survey paper by, by Bixby published in 2004 that said in, in roughly this 10, 15 year period, the speed up that you experience by running linear programs on a computer is one million. Back to 1,000 just from the computer hardware, which is about doubling capacity every one and a half years. Okay, but the fact of 1,000 just by improved algorithms on solving linear programs. <coughs> and if you have within 15 years a speed up by a factor of a million, that's just not a quantitative change. That's a qualitative change because now you can solve problems that you couldn't even didn't even think about to be solvable. 10 years earlier. So it was a major change. Now what do I mean by different types of computers? Traditional MPC, okay, successful in process industries, chemical process industries are described, sampling times in the order of minutes, computing power in the process industry essentially unlimited. Okay? That equipment is so expensive, if you buy a computer for 10,000, 20,000, it doesn't make any difference. So you can afford any computer power. But now, the applications are on embedded platforms. And on embedded platforms here, it was not at all obvious how one could solve those optimization problems that you have to solve in order to apply uh, predictive control, at least not within the available time frame that you need to do that. The solution. Now, why those embedded systems? Because they are ubiquitous. And here are some worldwide new achievements of embedded computing platforms. You see some forecasts, but you see that's in the roughly 10 billion, 15, 12 billion of systems per year ship. And with those computing platforms, they are now new opportunities, not only for doing MPC, but just more general automatic decision making based on optimization and model predictive control is just one approach uh, in this direction. So that's one driver, algorithm and computer hardware. Second driver I mentioned is complexity. So in what way has complexity changed our interest in pre predictive control? Article here from the Harvard Business Review some, some years back entitled Why Dinosaurs Will Keep uh, Ruling the Auto Industry. And the important thing is here a graph where they write how many, um, how many lines of code, code uh, in different products. Okay, going from US Air Force jet with 1.7 million to a, a automobile with 100 million lines of code. And what you have here, they increased just by four here between 2005 and 2010 in five years by a factor of, of four. But what went hand in hand also is an increase in the recalls. So the recalls have about doubled every 10 years, and I don't have to talk about recalls. You read about them every day uh, in the newspaper nowadays. It's pretty sure that GM recalls, for, for example, at the, at the moment. So clearly, not only uh, the industries, uh, not only the academics are concerned, uh, but also industry concerned. And uh, so one of the key efforts that's ongoing at United Technologies next door to you is formal verification of embedded software and model-based uh, uh, design. And so what they use as a basis is, is models of the system, the avionic system described by simulating models. And they look at say 10,000 to 250,000 of the simulating blocks that would describe such an avionics 
system and would check the correctness and the safetyness of algorithms described in this form. But the key step that has to be done before they can use their methods for the small checking is they have to do some simplification of those models and some abstraction. So the key step is to get the models in the form such that it can be handled by the tools. And it turns out that this is where MPC comes in because it allows a much tighter approximation of the algorithms than traditional control systems with logic that would provide a similar um, functionality. And so let me move on and uh, talk a little bit about this, this fast uh, MPC and what's the idea uh, behind it, those new algorithms that led to the possibility of applying those online control, uh, online optimization methods actually, not only in slow process system, but also fast mechanical electrical systems. And I will just have a few equations to hear uh, now to give you this sense. So the, the, the premise is that you determine the control action by solving some optimal optimization problem. And uh, even now, I would say that it's widely accepted in industry to trade off complex uh, specification and impose constraints on the states X, on the, the inputs U that are indicated by those capitals U and, and X. And this is kind of the, the stage cost, the penalty at a particular uh, time here. Uh, the minimized stage costs added up from zero to infinity are the, the value function, which I have to note here by J star. And so in principle, this you can solve this problem in quotes by solving a through dynamic program. And if you have, don't know what dynamic program is, it's also okay. So there's some scheme called dynamic programming, which in principle provides the solution to this problem. But the challenge is you can't solve it. You can write it down this way, but you can't solve it. So the challenge is computation. How do I solve this problem to get a controller that minimizes this objective function? So good reliable methods for this uh, dynamic programming solution were available only for linear systems without constraints. And that's the famous linear quadratic regulate the Riccati equation that we learned about in your control courses, which is really a solution to this dynamic programming problem in the special case of linear uh, systems. And from this perspective, model predictive control MPC is just an alternative method to solving this dynamic programming problem, or rather to solve this what's called the Bellman equation. Now, why is alternative method? What I do is I approximate this infinite horizon, as you see here, by a finite horizon, n steps. But we have to do it in a way such that the stability, which I get from here, from the real program, and the constraint satisfaction are preserved. And in order to do that, I have to add some terminal penalty, which means basically the tail end cost from n to infinity, or an approximation of this is added terminal cost. And you also add a terminal constraint to enforce the, um, the satisfaction of the constraints of the original problem. And so from today's perspective, this MPC is a different way of solving the Spellman equation with the further difference that here I looked for an explicit solution, a controller, u is equal to kx, like you get from the Ricard equation, while here the idea is that I do the online optimization, online to compute this uh, controller access. I do it at each time step, I do the optimization to determine uh, the and all the theoretical work on MPC has revolved on how to choose the terminal weight and how to choose the terminal constraint regions. That's all the theory, different methods. Okay. And theory is well established now and guarantees that you satisfy the constraints, that you preserve stability. But all that theory does is it assumes that the optimization problem that you have to solve can actually be solved in the allocated time frame. In chemical engineering, five-minute sampling time, infinite computer power, you can do that. 
if you have microseconds sampling time and little embedded processor, it's not so obvious how you can get the optimal. And so people have struggled the last 10 years or so um, to answer that question, and many different groups have tried that and have proposed different approaches. I'm just going to give you a very brief overview of what's done uh, in the context of those linear systems with constraints. And so when I talk about verifiable control uh, synthesis here, what I mean is calculating the control action with close to optimal within the available sampling time of, let's say, one microsecond or something. And uh, this has been a become a very popular research topic in the last decades. Actually, if you look at conferences, there are whole sessions or groups of sessions that are devoted just to this fast MPC topic on how to do that, how to do fast MPC within allocated, guaranteed execution uh, time. And um, I'll talk just about the uh, two of those um, ideas, uh, one which I refer to as explicit MPC, and um, we realized that about 50 years ago, or around um, uh, 2000 here, that this Feldman equation, the cut equation, which traditionally you could solve only for linear systems, you could actually solve it for linear systems with constraints. Okay, with linear constraints. The controller that you get is not u is equal to kx. It's a little bit more complicated. It's depicted here, so if you have x here, u is equal to kx would be some plane here. So this is not a plane, but it's piecewise planar, piecewise linear. Okay? And so this is now the optimal controller for solving this problem with linear constraints rather than down constraint case. And you can actually compute that surface, this controller. And in retrospect, it's kind of obvious. But at that time in 2000, when those groups here, different groups, more or less independently, more or less at the same time, found this, it was like a glass ceiling was broken. Suddenly, totally new application domains opened up to the methods of MPC when we thought that one could compute the solution in this, uh, in this way. And so once you have the solution in this form, how does the controller look like? Actually, the controller, you, you, uh, the, it divides the space X the state space into polytopical regions. So if you have a measurement x1 and x2, say what region does it lie in? And then in this region, you have a controller defined, a linear controller defined in this region. So two steps, find the region, two, do the simple evaluation. Now, this works fine if you don't have too many pieces. If you have a lot of pieces, the searching for the region that contains the state can take a lot of time. So for systems with, let's say, roughly five states, this gives you a very simple lookup procedure, microsecond sampling you can do. If you have too many regions, not in the tens or hundreds, but in the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, this is too complicated. Okay? And then the idea is you want to approximate this. This looks like a lot of little detail for something that looks almost like a step. So you want to approximate this control function, but you want to approximate it in a way that preserves the property of the control and makes stability and constraint satisfaction. And that gave rise to different methods I'm not describing in detail, approximate explicit control. Just going to tell you some application that gives you a sense of what you can use this for. Temperature regulation of a multi-core processor, say a processor uh, eight cores, and uh, what you want to do, you get some Workload requests, you want to track them, you want to minimize power usage, and you want to obey the temperature limits that are measured, temperature measured around the surface of the, of the processor. And you can actually define an MPC problem, you can actually get an explicit, approximate explicit solution to that problem, and therefore have this controller just do this, be a very simple lookup table, and you can execute it in 1,200 flops, 18 nanoseconds, which is a speed up of, depending on what you use as a basis, 3,000 or 70 compared to conventional optimization or a full explicit solution. Gives you a sense of the scope of applicability. So this method, feasible for about 10 states. 
You can specify the complexity, how complicated you allow the controller to be. Obviously, the less complex, the worse the performance. If it's not complex enough, it will not even be stable. Uh, Sub-microsecond sampling. If you have systems larger than 10 states, you cannot really use those offline methods. You have to resort to online optimization. But what you want to guarantee now, you run an optimi online optimization for a certain state where you are, and you want to guarantee that you get to the optimum, at least within a epsilon of the optimum, in specified sampling time. So it cannot be, you know, this time I take one minute, next time I take 10 seconds. That is not a real-time algorithm. You have to guarantee that whenever, for all the states that you have, within guaranteed time, you find the optimum or you're within epsilon of the optimum. And you can actually develop guarantees like that for first-order optimization methods by non-conservative bound, uh, variant of the gradient method, fast gradient method, do that, and you can get to essentially can handle any size problem, and any size meaning hundreds of states. And you can get to, let's say, microsecond and millisecond range, and I will give you some examples for that uh, later uh, on. If uh, that is not good enough, because the fast gradient method ill-conditioned systems has its limitations, and you go to interior point methods, we also have developed specified special algorithms to deal with the MPC problems resulting uh, or the optimization problems resulting from MPC problems. Uh, Alex Tomahidi, whom I mentioned initially, has developed a toolbox that actually generates code to solve the optimization problems resulting uh, from those uh, controller problems. Uh, code that um, is either ANSI C code or MAX files that you can test within MATLAB for the, for the uh, function. That uses all the um, latest technology in uh, solving those quadratically constrained uh, QPs that was work that was done in cooperation with uh, Stephen Boyd from Stanford University. Uh, Alex also started his company, but some early users of this forces toolbox, universities on the left, Alstom, uh, ABB, Danfoss, big companies, uh, European companies, various other universities have used that. And with that, you can now reach um, essentially for any system, not only for this well-conditioned system like with the first or the gradient method, uh, very good um, uh, sampling times, not quite as fast as what you can do with the first or the gradient method. And so, true to the spirit that I mentioned in the introduction, we haven't only done um, theory, we've done applications. And this gives you a range of applications we have been involved in from very slow ones, relatively slow ones at the bottom, to fast ones at the top. I've already talked about the multi-core thermal management. I will not talk about each one of those details, but you see it goes from the computer systems to the power electronic systems here on top, uh, to some automotive systems here, um, to energy efficient buildings uh, and controls here at the bottom. And so most of those things were done in collaboration with industry. Uh, essentially all of them, I have to look now, um, as far as I can see now, all of those have been done experimentally okay, to, to verify actually that, uh, that this works. I will talk about three of them, just to give you a glance to so get a sense of what, what it's about. He had talked about already, so I want to go um, here on top a little bit, uh, going to even faster applications where we do online optimization, where we have megahertz sampling rates. I will go here to the energy efficient building control, and first I will start with microscale race cars, not that this is the most important application, but this is what we try to use to interest the students, and especially the undergraduate students, in using those, those tools. So those are cars made in Japan um, that can go to five meters a second speed, remote controlled cars, and we want to set it up so it autonomously steers a 
course against a very good student uh, doing it uh, manually. And actually, this was really done, all that I'm talking about now was all done by undergraduate students. So they set up some camera system, some infrared tracking system to localize the car on this, uh, this racetrack, obviously using whatever was available in terms of um, vision uh, software. They redesigned the board that goes onto the little car. So we have uh, also uh, Bluetooth communication. We have uh, internal, uh, inertial navigation unit. We have a gyroscope. Um, we have a powerful chip, uh, which they, the undergraduates designed to go on this. And we have rebuilt the tracks because this was too slippery. The cars always flew off the track. So this is a, a custom built high grip track and give you some sense to that uh, movie uh, that shows not the latest, but not too bad. Um, <coughs> so this is uh, autonomously, the camera captures that, and then the car is driven autonomously. At some point, it's also slowed down. Uh, so you see more details. You see that it even a little bit has a power slide with the rear end. And it's running basically on a process that's equivalent to what you have on an, in your phone. Okay. Your obstacles. Uh, that's the thing you will see in a moment. Uh, then we had it uh, actually demonstrated at the European Control Conference, which you will see in a second. Uh, clearly, this is not too much of a challenge. You can at all prepare more or less. The, the challenge comes with the optical and the other students. So this was the demo. Um, so there's the obstacle. There's the an obstacle. So not always worked, uh, needless to say. Uh, now the question is, what didn't work? Usually it was the communication that didn't work. Uh, there are many aspects, obviously, beyond control that make this that I needed to, uh, to work. One may even argue that maybe control is not the most critical one in some of those uh, things. There was one example. When do you use megahertz sampling? Very close to us is uh, close, meaning across the lake. It's IBM Research, one of the national laboratories. Uh, they invented uh, atomic force uh, microscopy. You want to scan a sample with some needle, actually. The sample moves. The needle is stationary in order to um, uh, detect the, the surface. And that they want to do with megahertz, and we did our implementation uh, with MPC uh, to run on this example, just to give you the high end, uh, you know, the, the fast uh, limits. <coughs> Essentially, you don't need it faster. We had trouble finding any example that needs faster sampling than a megahertz. Okay. So this is about as fast as you need. Another example I mentioned buildings. This is a slide from United Technologies, the building technology with goal of carbon neutral buildings, uh, looking at security and looking at, at buildings in terms of um, in, in terms of energy savings. And so currently there's there are collaborations between a subsidiary of of, uh, uh, of United Technology by the name of Automated Logic Corporation in Atlanta with some other small startup, Brightbox, and just give you a give you a sample of what they have done, ALC together with Brightbox in terms of building implementations, so to give you a sense of the size of the problem. So there are about 20,000 signals processed every five years, and comes the optimization problem. The optimization problem that they solve every five minutes is 300,000 variables, uh, 500,000 constraints. Okay, with this uh, tackle. And that's a unit, with, that's a building with 600 different zones that we can tackle. So how does the future of this area look like? Okay. The future of this area, as well as many other engineering areas, or all engineering areas, eventually depends on the impact that we can make and the interest in the technology <coughs> we can create to that impact. And when I mean the interest, then it's one, the users, but it's also interest from the next generation of researchers and, and stu students. And the signs, I would say, in this direction are very positive in terms of industry pickup and students' interest. And to give you some example, beyond United Technology, 
Okay. You can say I'm paid by the United Technologies. This is uh, not paid by ABB. Um, here, a, a diagram that was uh, presented by Peter Tervish, uh, who uh, was the chief technology officer of ADB, and you cannot read that, but here are sampling times, so here are long sampling times, here are small complexity, large complexity. So what he described is this movement over the years, so 2000, 2005, 10, 15, the movement of using MPC from this slow, low complexity <laughs> chemical systems to higher and higher complexity fast systems in the electrical domain over these. And how about students' interest? We have now five uh, faculty uh, at this point, uh, three in mechanical engineering, uh, sorry, two in mechanical engineering, Raft Andrea and Nina Bacella, and three in electrical engineering, John Ligueras, Roy Smith and I. And give you a sense of the graduate course enrollment, moment, uh, how it has changed over those years when we started doing applications. In three courses, the MPC course, two lectures of which you will have uh, tomorrow, linear systems, the theoretical course, dynamic programming. Uh, you wonder how many people will take a course in dynamic programming these days. But you see that the enrollment, and here it has kind of flattened out just because of the total student population, has tripled, doubled. Okay, uh, over a two or three year period with like 140 year people taking a dynamic programming course every year. Okay. And every year, those students, they come anywhere from physics, architecture, mechanical, electrical, civil engineering, trying to apply those uh, technologies in their respective domains. So in conclusion, in terms of the theory and practice, the early phases of development, in all the cases that I have shown you, are driven by practitioners. Okay, and the theory, however, is then moved, used and needed to really push the envelope on those applications, and it's needed to communicate the tools to a broader range of users. NPC, and that I don't think is our bias, is becoming the control technology of choice for many challenging applications. And as I've shown you, nowadays, computation itself is not limiting the application of MPC. We are beyond that. Okay? And even in terms of cost of computation, we are beyond that for many um, applications. Now, when you see that, you know, and you think about physics, then sometimes you say, okay, this is really poor. Okay? That we have those physicists, and they have high energy physics, and they have the theory, and they predict those particle existence and nobody has seen them, and then they work for decades and billions of dollars, and they find this Higgs boson based on the theory. Okay? So we are really kind of poor engineers. We just do something better than what's in practice. But you have to realize that also in physics, this finding evidence, the theory, is an exception, not the rule. And I refer you to some very good lecture by... by um, Sir Richard Friend, who is a Cavendish Professor of Physics at Cambridge, and he has a whole lecture, his theoretical lecture of examples, and the dominant when the in physics, not theory was guiding. Some experimentalists found it, and then it took the theories years to come up with an explanation. So it's the same in other areas. And so I want to stop now, if you have time, this is just exactly our hour, but if there's time, I have some other cute examples on the role of theory in the practice of architecture. Just some pictures, but I'll first stop and then invite some questions. Thank you very much. That's wonderful, Manfred. Thank you. Uh, 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 I have a few questions related to the state of the art of PC. Now, uh, uh, first, uh, tell us a little bit about the uncertainty management in the form of, uh, uh, this is not a black box treatment, so uh, what is it that, that NPC can and cannot do uh, when it comes to, let's say, measurement uncertainties and modeling uncertainties? And That's second, a, very, a very good point. Actually, you know, I have a slide that I didn't show at the other side, and I have areas of research, okay? And one of them was exactly the robust 
stochastic noise case. Now, it would be a separate lecture. All I can say is that progress has been made. Okay? There are methods that explicitly can consider the uncertainty of the type you described, minimizing objectives like uh, expected value, worst case, depending on this. It has also been, again, something that has become possible relatively recently uh, only. Uh, thanks to computational power and progress in algorithm to solve those problems. Has this been solved satisfactorily? I'm not sure. Okay? Has there been made progress? Yes, absolutely great progress on this important uh, question. I'm sorry, if I can follow up here quickly. The infinite dimensional systems, time delayed uh, dynamics, what can NPC do for that? See, uh, basically you can say we, we cheated. Okay. <laughs> uh, we are using discrete time representations. Okay? That's our starting point. Delay is nothing. It just increases the order. So everything holds. Okay, so you can say we assume the problem away. Is this good or bad? I'm not sure. I had the same question uh, about uncertainty, but here is a follow-up. Applications, any of these recent advances that you say are not quite enough yet, have generated any applications, are there some real problems where there is a difference that you need MPC accounting for uncertainty uh, that have been, you know, uh, implemented? The accounting for uncertainty, frankly, I don't uh, know for sure, okay? I, I don't know for sure. I mean, examples, just to give you examples of where they have been uh, tried. Um, power flow problems, okay, with energy storage, okay, where the uncertainty comes from users uh, from supply. Uh, second example, which we actually have done and implemented, but you can ask if this the only way of doing it, maybe not, but the, the example is the following. We have done building control uh, using weather forecasts, okay, building climate control. And both in terms of theory and experiments, where we obtain weather data from the Swiss meteorological services, but obviously, and weather forecasts. Okay, and the weather forecast obviously has uncertainty associated with it. And so we can do the building management subject to the forecast and the uncertainty of the forecast in order to provide a more robust control than would otherwise be the case. Now, can you do that in other ways? Maybe yes, they'd be, you know. But it's, for us, it was a very, you know, the, the question is, if you have a control approach, is it direct or indirect? And using the stochastic approach that you apply, it was possible to do it very direct. Okay, we can say, that's a forecast, you get an uncertainty model, stochastic model from the forecast, from the meteorological services, and we can use it. So this is the natural approach to define the problem, the source of the problem. Can you get some similar solution some other way? Possibly, but not as direct. And I think that's also an important aspect. You talk about uh, when the number of state equals 10 is kind of small. How about the larger ones? Uh, say when the number of state becomes uh, 1,000 uh, or more, do you decompose of it to the distributed way? I can send you a paper that we have uh, we have done where we use, I mean, various steps in order to make it manageable. But the main thing we use an FPGA, okay, for implementation. And doing this and doing the parallel implementation in this uh, form on the FPGA has allowed us to do any damage. Okay. So, so basically, the answer is parallelization. Also, do you? And, and, sorry. And, but why? Because this problem, this optimal, lends itself to be able to do that. That doesn't mean that arbitrarily optimization problem of the size you control, but the optimization problem resulting from those control problems, we can tackle in this way. Uh, do you handle discrete variables? Excellent question. Yes, we, 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 did, we, we did. I will talk about it briefly uh, tomorrow. Okay. Um, we can handle them best if it's within a linear system 
otherwise plus discrete variables and propositional logic, okay, uh, this combination of if then else statements, discrete variables, etc., can be put into that framework. The difference is the optimization problem that results from it is not now a quadratic program like right here, but it's a mixed integer quadratic program or a mixed integer linear program. Okay? So that means clearly the type of problem size complexity that you can solve when um, integer or discrete variables are involved and when logic is involved is smaller. Okay? And this is, again, in terms of the open areas, in terms of improving the computation for systems like this, is an open issue. Mm -hmm. The approaches have been done, but I think, you know, they are really, I think, um, that's worthwhile to spend major effort because that I see the major gaps. Okay, the other thing I think, yes, we can improve, but here there's the biggest need for those type of systems. Yes. So obviously, uh, in the uh, application and implementation part, the hardware has to play a bigger role, right? And so I guess the reduction to 18 nanoseconds is it primarily due to nanotechnology and the other? This is not, in this case, this one case, okay, uh, that I mentioned, that there was, this is very, the algorithm, okay, in this case, is extremely simple. All right? In the sense that all you have to do, you have to run through a set of inequalities and check which are satisfied. Okay. And then you have to do a few multiplies. That's all. Okay? So it means that the, after you have done this approximate explicit MPC, the big advantage is it's very simple computation. Okay? If you do the computation online, if you solve the quadratic program, linear program, mixed integer program online, then the hardware plays a big role. So as I answered before, without parallelization, you cannot handle the large systems at those center gates. Okay? So then the hardware really becomes critical. If you can compute that optimal solution beforehand and store it in a simple form for small enough systems, hardware is not so critical. Are there any other questions? I have uh, actually a couple of questions. Uh, how do you teach MPC for undergrad kids? Uh, do you do that or no? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to do the project though, right? Uh, and I, okay. I should be more more specific. Uh, until ten or years ago, uh, or so. Uh, as you, I'm sure, know, in Europe, there was a system, you got a diploma in engineering, okay, and then you did, if you wanted, the PhD. There was no bachelor master. Then there was a study reform, so now we have a bachelor and we have a master. But actually, in our mind, often those undergraduates are the master students because most of the bachelor students are adhering to the old system and doing a master's, and this combination corresponds to the diploma previously. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we had to do the bachelor master, but we're actually still doing kind of the diploma. And when I say undergraduate, it is both bachelor and master students. I should be more specific. Yes, and the master students are yes, they take standard the course that that I'm. Um, Giving you going to about tomorrow. How do you select the value of n? I'm assuming that it should be some function of the number of states. Right. No, it's not so much. The, the main the main thing is um, you you select it by the longer you select it, the more complex the problem gets. Okay, to solve because it increases the number of variables, increases the number of the special it increases the number of constraints, and then it increases the solution. So you want it short, but you also know that if you do it too short, for another example, then it's bad. Okay, it, its ability, or at least the performance, bad because it corresponds to a very short-sighted strategy. You don't care what happens longer term; you just do what's best, uh, short. And so you really do that compromise between com computational resources and how much you need. And I would say you iterate a little bit, it's not so, you know, as you design. Okay. It's not a it's not a, in, in application, I would say it's the least critical issue. Okay. 
last question is uh, to address the uncertainty. Have people done like stochastic programming or scenario based? Yes, absolutely. Okay. absolutely. Yes, uh, I have done uh, exactly. I mean, uh, I think everything that was done uh, or in or or only a programming. Okay. Uh, they, 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 not not us. Okay, but in the literature, my colleague there was has uh, has done in this in this context with taking advantage of this particular. So give me two minutes. I do want to share that architecture because I think it's really neat. Okay. So, assistant professors of architecture designs those fantastic buildings. That's actually some some uh, pavilion in Austin, Texas. Okay. Uh, and I just give you some glimpses into this design. So now I see some how it looks. Okay, so question, what's special about it? What's special about it is it's composed of those little blocks. Okay, and those blocks, and this is the model, those blocks are not glued together. They're just holding together by gravity. Okay, and so in the real world, that's not reinforced steel, but it's just big blocks of stone that are sitting on each other. Okay, without any concrete or any connection. And so that means also if you disturb this a little bit, like here, okay, it may hold up for certain perturbations. If you disturb it a little bit more, it will collapse. <laughs> so what does that have to do with theory and practice? Okay. This is practice of building arches pushed to the limit. Arches have a long history. That's the Romans, you know, and 4,000 years be before us, not the Romans, 2,000 before the Romans. Arches were built. They didn't have any theory to guide them, okay? Theory was developed over the years. Papers published that in 1695, how do we build arches? But the way those buildings that I've shown you a build you cannot do without theory. So it's a game. There's practice. Okay? You can do a lot of practice, but if you want to push that to the limit, you need the theory to support it. Now, why do I show you this as an example? It has um, some important connections to, to, to us, and it's connected to our research. Because there's one thing to understand how this structure holds up, and the other thing to understand how to build it. And so actually they have to, as you see, they have to put some form, then they have to build the bricks together, and then they have to remove that form just at the right speed so nothing sags so that it holds up. And actually we are involved in a 10 year, I'm not sure I will be involved to the end, multi-million dollar National Compensation Center for Research, which will investigate, among other topics, how to use robots to assist in this building process. Okay, and that's also controlled. So that's just what I said at the farewell. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs>